Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Today is the second presentation that followed my presentation, Are We Witnessing Something Strange to the Russian Cold Nuclear Transmutation and Ball Lightning Community on the 17th of June 2020. This was also a presentation given by Zatalepin V, that's Valeri, uh, but it was of work done by his colleague, uh, Dmitry Baranov. The title of the presentation is Registration of Tracks of Unknown Particles on a Gold Covering of a Plate of the Silicon Alpha Detector. The experiment was conducted on the 5th of October 2007. The experiment consisted of a small drop of bismuth sulfide solution in water under one potential and influenced by an external electrode of a different polarity. The external electrode was separated from the drop by a thin fluoroplastic film. At the same time, in the surface layer of the solution drop, there was an electric field with the voltage of 4 times 10 to the power 8 volts per meter. The droplet was kept in the electric field for 20 minutes. After exposure to the electric field, the drop had dried in that 20 minutes. The bismuth salt that remained after drying was placed near a silicon surface barrier alpha particle detector at a distance of 2 to 3 millimeters from the detector surface. The diameter of the detector surface was 22 millimeters. The surface of the detector is covered with a thin, shiny layer of gold. It was assumed that in the sulfuric salt of bismuth, which was kept in an electric field, there could be a transformation of chemical elements producing alpha particle radiation. The detector was supposed to detect alpha particles coming out of the dried salt. And indeed, alpha particles were detected. But in addition, something unexpected was discovered. In addition to detecting alpha particles, the experiment provided information about unknown particles scratching the smooth surface of the detector. Now, I've inserted a slide here just for reference. These are some notes. Uh, essentially, um, there is a trace of 212 bismuth in natural bismuth. Uh, bismuth sulfide is not soluble in water, but is in acid. So presumably, this was dissolved in an acid before put into a solution of water. And uh, just as a note, uh, bismuth is ingested as bismuth subsalicylate. You can say that. In Pepto-Bismol, an anti-acid medicine. It's also used in targeted alpha particle therapy. And this graphic has come from the National Institute of Health from the US. And it shows that the decay uh, or uh, parent product of 212 bismuth, uh, which has this 60.6 minute half-life and produces this alpha decay, is uh, 212 lead. And above that is an alpha decay. Uh, uh, which gets you to the 212 lead to 216 polonium and then another alpha to 220 radium. So that's just for reference before we move on. So the silicon detector before experiment looked like this. The slide silicon detector before experiment shows a picture of the detector surface that has not yet been used to measure the alpha particles escaping from the bismuth sulfur salt. You can see that the surface is almost uniform. Now if you go to this link here and the PDF for this presentation uh, will be given in the description uh, to the video at the end of the premiere. But you can go to Ortec online and it talks about uh, how their detectors of this type, the silicon detectors for looking at uh, uh, charged particles like alpha and beta, uh, highly uh, um, uh, specific and sensitive, um, have this gold coating on the outside because specifically it doesn't oxide. And uh, he says that it's gold coated on the uh, front uh, of the actual uh, silicon film. And so that's kind of what, what you might see if you were looking at this in the hole. And uh, this film on the front here looks a bit like that one. Um, I guess it's just an angle thing. 
that gives it that sort of brown appearance that's quite closely matched there. Anyway, moving on. Photo of the detector surface after 20 minutes exposure time next to bismuth salt on the 18th of October 2007. Okay, so that does not look like that. That does not look like that. This is 18 minutes after exposure. And anyway, anyway, um, uh, after two hours of measuring the alpha activity of bismuth salt, it was found that the entire surface of the detector was scratched by a series of parallel tracks. So you can see these parallel tracks here, which kind of curve down, these tracks here, um, and then there are a range of other tracks, some, some uh, going over here. And you can look at this in your own time. There are also some ones over here that kind of like, uh, kind of semi-offset clones of each other. Now, immediately you might think, oh, this is just something that happened to scratch the surface. Um, but it's like, you, <laughs> it's in, not in contact. It's two to three millimeters away. Uh, and it was exposed uh, for a period of time. And this was uh, after two hours of measuring the activity from the salt. This is the photo of detector on the surface on the 15th of the 5th, so uh, May 2009. So this is... October 2007, this is May 2009. Interestingly, new traces on the detector continued to appear weeks and months after the experiment. This slide shows the detector surface 1.5 years after the end of the experiment. Comparison with the previous slide shows that new tracks have appeared on the surface. One of the new tracks is shown in the photo at the bottom of the slide. The arrow shows its place on the detector surface. So you can see there's this kind of splodge here and there's this dark line here. And if we go down to the next slide, there's the splodge and the kind of dark line here. And there's this new track here, which is kind of blown up and rotated and placed down here. And you can see it appears like a whole load of uh, parallel scratches um, with a little kink here. Discussion. In addition to the new tracks on the detector after 1.5 years, the detector records alpha activity flashes with a spectrum typical of bismuth decay 212. One of these alpha activity flashes lasted for seven hours. Perhaps this information by Baranoff D about sample activity after a long time is one of the first observations in the world on this subject. I can recall that Fleischmann and Pond's experiment in 1989 took place over 70 days. Only on 72 days, I think they started to register some strange signals. It was as if something had been prepared for 72 days during the electrolysis reaction to spew out as excess energy. So what you're seeing here, potentially, is something has occurred. Uh, something was passed to this uh, a highly conductive uh, um, gold layer on this silicon uh, a year and a half before and at some point in that intervening time uh, an event happened which caused something to produce this stretch along here. Now I'm going to talk about other examples of where similar systems produced things that I think are worth considering at this point. So the one thing that this system was under when it was um, being formed was a high electric field. And in ball lightning, you typically get a high electric field because uh, you have a, a, a storm system. And uh, often you get lightning and Ken Shoulders says that all ball lightning, so all lightning is uh, headed by uh, a ball lightning. In the Hutchison effect, he typically had a high electric field in play and rapid discharge involved. In fact, uh, he told me today that um, they would, um, he would almost continually have a uh, discharge going on in his working environment. And that was uh, uh, continuous and very, very loud. <laughs> um, quite a lot of um, uh, pulsed power uh, in a very short period of time. Um, and... He had it initially between the spark gap and then in a xenon uh, tube uh, that he got uh, ex-military part from so something like a, a flood, floodlight to two tungsten electrodes uh, in xenon.
Um, Parkamov's capacitor-based diffraction grating work, and, and this is basically the kind of work that he did to uh, uh, actually discover N radiation, which uh, he calls it N radiation because he didn't know at the time what it was, but it had uh, the ability to act like it had cold neutrinos involved. And in that case, he had a, a field of uh, 10 to the 7 volts per meter. And this is described in his book, uh, Space Earth Human, here. And uh, it's uh, on page, if you have the book, uh, let's have a look, uh, 53. And you can see the kind of setup here. And it's uh, called a uh, narrow gap spark chamber. And so uh, you can see the kind of layout of this with the film in the middle, two glass plates with electrodes uh, made onto them, uh, some insulator, and it's in a, uh, a box. And uh, this is one of the ways in which he uh, did his initial work. So this was done in the 1980s um, under sort of a Soviet sort of science. And uh, he went on to uh, see these spots, which you might have recalled seeing something similar in the uh, precedent presentation to this one. Okay, so that is um, the work of uh, Alexander Parkamov, again with a very high field. Uh, Shishkin actually found uh, with a capacitor pulse uh, where he had, uh, by applying a high voltage pulse of plus or minus 590 volts on an X-ray film in an op opaque package located between plates of flat capacitor with a 8 millimeter distance between the electrodes. He observed these string vortex solitons. You can go and have a look at the presentation. I've given the link here. And these are um, black evos, uh, and uh, they form these tracks. So here, again, with a capacitor-type system, um, you've observed some sort of uh, traces. Now, what's actually happening in Parkamov uh, 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 system, he, he's actually uh, um, allowing... Uh, the stressed uh, voltage differential to then some particles are somehow getting in there and they're causing an avalanche and, and this causes a discharge and that's why it's this uh, spark sort of camera as it were and we all know from uh, shoulders that every spark uh, involves exotic vacuum objects so it's not unreasonable to suggest that the system where they have these even higher voltages here per meter uh, they they may actually be uh, producing an environment where um, exotic vacuum objects uh, could uh, self organize and become part of the system anyway th this is just discussion points but then I wanted to talk about other systems uh, that observed similar kind of tracks to the ones that you're seeing here appearing after a long period of time. And so I return to this image uh, that I shared with you in the previous presentation from uh, that I published on 28th of July 2017. And uh, what I'm now going to look at is the uh, container that contained the, the fuel. And the images that I shared around this time uh, were uh, highly detailed and they showed these scratch marks you see these scratch marks all over and what's striking about these they often nucleate at one point and span out sometimes in straight lines with lots of parallel lines and sometimes the parallel lines are then curving so the kind of feature that you're seeing here with parallel lines and, and some curvature is not an unreasonable thing to observe in a Lena related system. The other thing that's striking about this as well is that uh, uh, you've got a star down here and here you've got these um, uh, this is the actual polymer of the uh, fuel uh, storage container and it's actually shredding it and what you're looking at here is the fact that it's shredded the plastic and th this actually has become extremely brittle at this point and uh, the, there are these lines. And uh, typically with, for instance, uh, CR39 plastic, you expose it to some, say, alpha radiation or, or, or neutron radiation, and then you use a chemical etchant. And uh, that um, uh, breaks up the polymer where the uh, polymer's uh, molecular connections have been damaged by the passing or Im impinging radiation. But you can see over here, I mean, when you look at this image, uh, uh, when you look at the PDF, you can see it's absolutely striking the way it's shredded this. And 
The interesting thing about this is, unlike this, where one might accuse uh, or suggest that there's been some scratching going on and that's how it's occurred, in this instance, it was just sat there on the plate, uh, this photographic plate here, and essentially it's impossible for it to scratch. These grew over a period of time. Now, I never actually saw one of these uh, drawing themselves out, and I wish actually in hindsight I'd had a high-speed camera trained on this looking for some sort of, uh, with some sort of code to look for deviations of image um, and uh, be able to capture these things as they occurred to know if they just instantaneously appeared or whether they kind of grew over a period of time. But certainly I, I would come in after a couple of days and, and look at this uh, and it was covered over with a metal thing on the top. And there were these tracks, and they were just there, and, and, and you know, they were shredding the plastic. So there we have that. Uh, there's some more images here. And again, you can see this kind of star-like feature here, and you can see much more of the kind of uh, shredding here going on. Lots of shredding going on here. All this kind of shredding here at angles is maybe not so clear uh, on the camera, but you can see it in your own time. So a lot of high energy damage was occurring to this polymer. Now, um, this, again, I want to reiterate, this cannot be a three-body interaction problem because there's fuel sliding with a bit of grit in between because nothing was moving. It was just sat in there and, and the, the tracks were appearing and the damage to the uh, plastic container was occurring. When I took the fuel out, it actually had the tracks on here, and maybe this is even clearer. You can see, for instance, here, two very defined uh, tracks here parallel, multiple tracks here parallel, all of these tracks parallel. And you see, I shared all of this long before I received these images uh, uh, a week or so ago. Uh, <clears throat> and, and this work was done before this work was done, like 10 years before nearly, uh, certainly uh, eight years before. So um, here we have these parallel tracks, and um, the interesting thing about this is if we look at another area of the fuel, here we have this kind of ear shape here with this uh, sort of lobe at the bottom that we see in a large number of Lena systems. But uh, it, uh, maybe it's, if I can change the contrast, um, you can see that around the edge there are the tracks coming out. And uh, they kind of are radial. And the interesting thing is that there, there appear to be these sphere-like structures here, here, here. And the tracks tend to point to the sphere, um, which in itself, uh, to me, is very interesting. So I encourage you to go and look at that video where I look at that in detail. And here's, here's a kind of close-up. So you can see there's a sphere here. And these tracks are coming off. Maybe they're connected to that, but there appears to be a sphere here and a sphere here. And there's a sphere here, and you can see the tracks coming off. And so, and there are multiple parallel tracks in those things, uh, similar to what you see here. So you could imagine that under the surface here, there was an event. Whatever the event was, uh, it caused these tracks to uh, come out. Um, so... I want to look at something else that was done by Ken Shoulders that could come some way to explaining what you're observing here. And this is uh, bead chains. Now, um, I'm going to read this thing, and it's from Ken Shoulders Permittivity Transitions. You can see this on the web archive link down here. When one views the complexity with which EVs can arrange themselves. It engenders visions of complex electronic systems that manufacture themselves at electronic rates. To the right here is examples showing some of the complexities possible. Uh, in many cases, the number of EV beads involved reach into the hundreds, even in experiments seeking simplicity in structure. Although very little work has been done on organizing EVs into useful structures, they are constantly trying to do so without constructive guidance. Now, uh, there are two kind of spots in the middle here. There's a range of little spots in here. It's very clean on the outside in both uh, examples. And it's not necessarily a, a perfect circle. This might have been taken at an angle, so it might have been more circular, but uh, squished into an ellipse. 
But of course, there's, there's, there's three here that are kind of radially arranged, but at that spot. There seems to be a substructure on these, so they're not just a simple sphere. There's something else going on, and again, you can see here. And he has other ones where one has sort of come apart, and it's gone off, and it's made a track, and those tracks have gone and split out. And you can see something similar here, where this is coming out, and it's come to this point, and it's splitting off into multiple area, uh, uh, directions. Um, these things are uh, kind of correlating in some way. But if you can imagine this, and I described this in my Sochi presentation, that you could get a cluster of things, uh, and I clawed my hand like this, and I'm, I, I said that it's, it's scratching around the surface. So if it's going along like this, if you can imagine this, and it's going along the surface, it's going to leave a load of parallel tracks, some which kind of partially overlay. And, and, and if it moves up and down, you're going to have them... Uh, interacting with each other. And this is exactly what you see here. You can see these lines getting very close together and then spanning apart. So you can imagine if I'm going like this and I'm moving out and in a little bit for whatever reason, um, uh, you would end up with a track like this and you would end up with tracks very similar to what you're observing here. So is this the case that uh, a clustered EV bead has come at from an event, say for instance here, gone boom, and multiple ones of these clustered EVs that have come out, and they've slid along between the fuel and the inside plastic, producing these parallel track uh, uh, marks. That is kind of how I would see this occurring. And this isn't the only system that we observed these kind of bead chains. Um, uh, this is in the Lion 2 fused quartz. And I've got a link here to the video at the point where you observe this. And this is on the outside of the quartz uh, liner. So the reactor is buried well, well inside here. So if the Evo, Evo was born or, or the Evo cluster or uh, clusters of smaller uh, clusters of EVOs and then came out all the way through the, the reactor core, through the copper, copper oxide, and then through the quartz and then came out and got stuck between the, the quartz and the alumina in the air gap between the two, the alumina foam. This EVO uh, <laughs> bead chain here uh, left this mark and you can see it's very, very similar to the one under SEM. So this is an optical microscope. You see there's a, a two-spot feature with a circle here in the center. And you can go and see this on the video, so you, you can get an impression of where it's placed and what else is going on. Interestingly, nearby there are some parallel scratches uh, running around the quartz as well. Um, so uh, these things are kind of lining up. Now, uh, I, I, I'm going to refer back to these kind of explosions here when I hit the next slide, which is also referring back to the previous presentation where uh, Keith Fredericks produced this using his fingers. We fingers produce EVOs, and he created this as a circular um, series of circles. And uh, we have this uh, uh, star from uh, Matsumoto. So this is Matsumoto's book. Uh, uh, thank you, Sho, for providing this to me. And uh, in here, uh, it's got this uh, paper on the star formations, and then he studies what they're doing. And again, you can see these kind of curved uh, features. Anyway, I have a give. I will give you a link to the English uh, translation of this. And in fact, I don't think this particular star uh, is in the uh, paper, so it's worth having access to this. Um, because uh, I think Keith Fredericks uh, secured this uh, from Matsumoto from another source. Anyway, the link to it is there. And again, referring back to the previous presentation, uh, in 1992, at the, uh, in this paper, he is saying, during the hydrogen-catalyzed fusion reaction, in which the hydrogen cluster is extremely compressed to depolarize the hydrogen nuclei. So if you remember the torsion balance and uh, there was a discussion by the scientists saying that there is uh, the, the, the uh, whatever the particles are that are coming out, they are depolarized. So here we have uh, uh, Matsumoto in 2000, uh, sorry, 1992 talking about this. Now I'm going to go to this paper here. Observation of stars produced during cold fusion. This was published in Fusion Technology in 1992. Uh, received January the 2nd, 1992. And I just want to read a few excerpts here. Uh, he's saying, during the hydrogen catalyzed fusion, so this is the uh, uh, point I've just read, uh, furthermore, nuclei consisting of greater than 100 neutrons 
can be produced from a host metal of palladium by capturing hydrogen atoms or, and or electrons. So this is electron capture. What happens when you have electron capture? You have a lot of cold neutrons being synthesized. What are the cold, sorry, you have a lot of cold neutrinos as well as the cold neutrons uh, being synthesized. And so uh, this could uh, build a, some sort of a neutrino cluster. Um, down here, uh, he's saying, among the multiple neutrons, light ones, such as cord neutrons, collapse by self-gravity to make micro-explosions whose traces have been observed on nuclear emulsions. Nuclei with a great number of neutrons undergo similar gravity decay to produce tiny black holes whose evaporations have also been observed. Now, I'm, he, he makes a point later on in 2001, and it's on the same slide that I've just shown you, um, which it builds on his understanding uh, from late 1991, which is recorded in this paper. Uh, he also says here, nuclear reactions might be seen outside of the electrolyzing cell uh, during cold fusion. He is saying that something is able to pass out of the reactor and interact with nuclear uh, nucleons outside of the reactor and do uh, nuclear reactions. Exactly what we are observing. Now, coming on to the actual star-like structures, he says that... Um, they are all star-like, referred to as cold fusion stars, similar to traces that are produced by cosmic rays. So he was an expert in nuclear emulsions and what you might see on them. The number of emitted particles products is far larger for the cold fusion stars than for the cosmic stars, shown in figure 2 of ref 6, so in another uh, figure, uh, another reference he's got, uh, a figure that shows a, a typical one from a cosmic ray. It is easy to distinguish them. He's saying that these are not environmentally driven, cosmic ray driven stars. Um, they are as a result of the cold fusion. And so here we go. Uh, and effectively, this is coming from the emulsion. It's outside of the reactor. And you have an event here. And he describes the various types. These curved ones and these uh, slightly fanning ones here are the ones that have the rings in them. So I would view these as kind of like substructure evos exploding out of the event here, which was at a much, much, much greater density. So here we go. And if you, if you actually look at what he says here, on the other hand, particle F has a large curvature. So it might be an incident particle such as an itonic quadrineutron. Like I say, he moves on and I will, I will show you his thinking had moved on from late 1991. But that's what he was calling at this time because the itonic cover is highly charged. He's saying that uh, th this is effectively a white Evo. The itonic cover is this kind of like mesh of um, uh, some type of electron structure uh, over the, the uh, material. So he's referring to this F with this curved line, which you can see here, this, this curved track up here. Now, um, the stars were obviously caused by some particles that were producing cold fusion, produced during cold fusion. It is inferred that multiple neutrons, such as quad neutrons, might have collided with the nuclei of the nuclear emulsions to produce the stars. So something has come out of the cold fusion reactor. It's interacted with this material that is in the, the uh, photographic plates, the, the X-ray emulsions, or the nuclear emulsions, rather, and caused these stars. So there's another star, and he talks about that and does the tracks. There's another star, and he talks about those uh, too. And so that's it. Now, uh, on this slide, I've also uh, got another uh, document uh, excerpt from Fusion Science and Technology, July 2001. And the reason I've got this in here is because he is addressing the... Um, uh, old understanding that he had at the end of 1991 into 1992 and correcting it. He says, my three ring traces were products of those simultaneous explosions. Here, I have to apologize to readers for an insufficient assignment made in Ref 5, the one that I'm talking about, that quad neutrons collapsed. It was made clear by later experiments that clusters that collapsed were atomic clusters that could have a diameter of hundreds of micrometers and involve much more nuclei. 
Very amazingly, it was also found later that the ring products consisted of conventional elements, mainly carbon, not depending on the collapsed materials. This process was called nuclear regeneration. Furthermore, white wispy markings between my ring traces were remains of interconnected electrons. Remains of interconnected electrons? What, like they're not electrons? Or they're just electrons that happen to, to be hanging about there? Or remains? Which were more obviously shown in figure 3 of Ref6. Those electrons form networks like mesh and played an important role in causing curious phenomena like ball lightning during cold fusion related experiments. So, I am going to go to the 2001 article in Fusion Technology. And here he's uh, discussion, discussing comments made by Ed Lewis. And he says, Lewis pointed out similarity between plasmoids observed in plasma focus discharge experiments by Nardi et al., which include the work of Bostig, and traces that were obtained from nuclear emulsion during my electrolysis cold, cold fusion experiments. I appreciate him for having carefully watched my data. Shoulders et al. proposed a model of electron beads by performing a discharge experiment. I proposed a model of special clusters, the NATO model, as soon as cold fusion was published and developed it by performing experiments of electrolysis and, and, and underwater spark discharges. Probably we discussed similar objects with different terms having different uh, contents. So he is giving credit to Shoulders uh, and uh, also Nardi and Bostic, uh, that they had probably observed the same phenomena, but that the, the structures that are made can hold a, a range of different contents, and so the outcomes you see and the structures that are formed uh, give you a different impression of what's going on. Clusters could effectively be generated mainly on the surface of atomic clusters, when many electrons were charged. Here, many electrons were assumed to be interconnected. Bonding of those electrons could be so strong that the clusters were violently compressed. Several kinds of nuclear reaction could take place within the itonic clusters. The most significant reaction was nuclear collapse. So, whatever these clusters are, and I would imagine them, and this is an important part of O'Day, that um, you have these O's and they can then come together and they can form a mesh and, and then uh, they're pushing and pushing and pushing and they are compressing it into a small box and what he is saying here is nuclear collapse. I suggest that what you are observing here with these stars in the work of Matsumoto and what you are observing here with these uh, explosion events uh, here in the work of uh, echo and my analysis work uh, is something akin to what he describes uh, very specifically as nuclear collapse. Uh, this is the apology where he says basically um, yes uh, it wasn't actually just quad neutrons it was very large numbers of nuclei and that these uh, uh, generally led to the production of carbon not depending on collapsed materials. Uh, he also, uh, one final point here, I would agree uh, with Lewis's idea that the ring craters and the markings uh, uh, like brush, brush discharges obtained by Nardi et al. resembled well the ring products and white wispy markings during my cold fusion experiments respectively. But it would be much more important for science uh, it not only to observe facial phenomena but also to understand the physics involved there. An element analysis would easily resolve the problem. If nuclear collapse were involved in the experiment of Nardi et al., a large quantity of carbon element would have been found in the ring craters. Please remember that. I'm going to talk about that when I refer to what happened in Japan with the 10 yen coin. So, Lastly, we have something which is enabling uh, material not only to be crushed into a ring, but also to be put into a mesh box, which is then able to crush down, crush down, and crush down until there is a, uh, an explosive event uh, recorded uh, on the materials here by uh, uh, Echo, by Suhas Ralkar, 
and myself uh, that is likely to have been the cause, in my opinion, of at least these uh, formations, or if not, it was uh, one of these kind of bead chains, like this on the Lion 2 and this on Shoulders work, that is scratching the marks out along the surface and um, this is kind of like a supernova. And now you might be <laughs> coming to the realization of why I call the supernova reactor the supernova. And here is uh, a supernova. And this is a very, very famous supernova. Uh, it was discovered, I think, in 1987, hence its name. And uh, it's a ring and a spot. And uh, over time, you can, you can see that the spot is kind of... Um, kind of divided a bit but it still has some substructure in there obviously a lot of the images that you see from um, imaging are, of space are false colored but uh, you, what you can see here is a spot in the middle and two spots to the side what did you see in the presentation I gave yesterday kind of like a ring with two spots on it and something in the middle is it the same kind of thing that's going on I don't know um, here we can see very, very defined spots. They kind of, I think if you looked at these, they would have a lot of structure within them. But obviously we can't see them because of the distance. But you can see that it is a ring and you can see there's a kind of semi-regular spacing going on and a var variation in intensity. And this does look a lot like what you're seeing here. It does look a lot like, like what you're seeing here. And another point to note is that you actually have something here which they say that is three rings. You've got the central ring with these curves, uh, which you might have seen something similar discussed on the primer field. Um, but it, it, it's definitely something to do with expanding out and maybe magnetic. But anyway, what they've done here is they've, they, I think they've done a computer simulation of what it would be if you kind of rotate this round. Obviously, we haven't got another viewpoint that's looking at it like this. Um, but anyway, we have rings coming out and then this structure. So... There are multiple types of events that occur during supernova. And would this kind of thing account for the observations, the, the rings that, that, that we see that seem to have some type of behavior and other things? Uh, could you get more rings coming off? Would it always be in this orientation? Are these rings uh, something to do with what we are seeing in the, this kind of work with the, the rings here and the, the rings here are the, the rings, the things that join together to make the cluster that crushes things into a supernova. Anyway, lots of food for thought there. In the next video, I will talk about uh, some specific traces that were found by Zhigolov and Parkamov and relate those to other observations in the field. Thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video.